So, mate, you're obviously a, a three-time Paralympian, recent world record holder as well. Unofficially, but yeah, we'll get that over the line at some yeah, point. Okay, yeah, okay, amazing. So, uh, obviously, uh, some amazing sporting achievements, and it's fair to say that you're uh, an elite athlete. You know, and you're jacked as well, mate. So, <laughs> so mate, you look the part, but obviously, you've got some limitations. Um, are you able to just to tell us what they are and what the disabilities that you currently have are? Yeah, obviously. It's not for me to say all those glorious things, but those opportunities were opened up because I'm, yeah, I'm disabled. I guess that's um, been, I'd say the best thing that's ever happened to me. It makes me me. And obviously my, my disability and my career and how, how my life has spanned stems from being born with a, with a bone condition. Um, it's called multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. So basically in layman's terms, it be, it means that all my bones are misshapen. They don't grow properly. Um, it's very arthritic, um, almost in the sense that like I wake up in the morning and my bones are like concrete, like I can hardly move. And I, I, I don't want it to sound like a sob story, but it is gen it's hard for me to articulate it without making it sound well, exactly how it is, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I was born with, with that. I was also born with a hole in my heart. So, um, had a condition called tetralogy of fallow. So I guess growing up it was, it was in and out of hospital um yeah a lot of that's a blur to me oh, i know you can remember what happens <laughs> when they were born but um yeah i think my parents uh shaped my mindset quite a lot they kind of treat me like i've got an older brother as well so he's a year older than me um and never really considered myself disabled as such and i think there's a long period of growth i guess when you're growing up well every kid goes through it everyone goes through it doesn't they when they're yeah, you don't know who you are. You're kind of growing up. You're not so sure of yourself. Some people are maybe, but n not for me. It was it was a long kind of period of acceptance, I think. Um, and that's I think that's why it makes me, it's given me a talent. I guess it's a talent. Who knows what talent is? That's another conversation in mm. itself, isn't it? But to be able to um, deal with certain situations, things like pressure, you could throw anxiety into there, like... Um, ability to deal with pain for sure that is one of my talents but not because of yet yeah, because of my disability like i think it's not despite it it's it's because of it everything that's happened in my life um stems from that so we can go back to like i'm very stoic now that, well again that makes it sound it's not for me to say but i practice a lot of stoicism meditation i never would have got into that if it wasn't for some of the experiences i had and experience is the greatest teacher we can go on to all of that in a minute but um, yeah, no, Amor, Fatty, love your fate. Like being disabled has like kind of made me. And again, there's 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 kind of a spectrum of disability, isn't there? Everyone's got their own struggles. You could say everyone's disabled in some ways because you know there's always something that's you, there's something you can't do, right? So does that make everyone disabled? I think I'm fascinated by this whole concept of disability, and that's what I really want to speak about genuinely. Because um, yeah, Amor, Fatty. I love it and, and it's made me who I am. So if, yeah, any qu questions on the actual specifics of my disability, we can, no, no holds barred, like go for it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm curious, man. I, I looked back for your, uh, your Instagram and I think it was a picture of you as, as a, as a youngster, as a kid, looking quite smiley, I think from what I remember, um, but kind of wrapped up in some sort of metal wear. Um, yeah. And there's been a, you know, a, a few pictures of x-rays where obviously you've had surgeries. So it sounds like, an, and as you say, you were in and out of hospital, multiple surgeries. I mean, what was your earliest memory as a child of, of all that sort of stuff? Oh, it's, fun it's funny, actually. I had this conversation yesterday about how I originally, so my left leg is a little bit more, I've got a bit more of a limb difference in my left leg um, because I actually broke it when I was 10 playing football. Um, so all in, for all intents and purposes, my, like I said, I thought I was able-bodied. I could do everything and run around, whatever. Um, it wasn't until I broke my leg when I was 10 that it really hampered the growth of my bone on my left leg. So there's that that parody that we run, wonky and his Viking. My left leg is like the wonky bit to me. But yeah, no. um, I remember the snap of my leg break still vividly. Like it not haunts me, It's like, but it did haunt me for a while. Um so yeah, I had loads of, uh, well, I had operations prior to that because my left leg was historically worse than my right leg. Um, and all my, all my, like you can hear my elbow, maybe. You hear that? Like, <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. I don't know if it's, it's still painful. It's probably as painful as it used to be. Maybe, maybe more. I'm just, 
I can deal with it better now. Like it's become normal. And that whole kind of, you know, principles of seek discomfort, being comfortable with being discomfort, you know, pain. Like that's not painful anymore because I'm used to it. Anyway, reversing back, like I kind of grew up with all these operations and whatnot, but that was, that was the, the, the crunch point, I suppose. That was the, the, the point in time where I could no longer do what, I so used to be able what to did, do. What did the break cause? So you, you obviously broke your leg and then it, it... Just didn't grow back properly. So if all... And yeah, so my bone basically snapped. My femur basically went straight through my femur. Oh, you then your femur. Yeah, it was horrible. I must have made yeah. a crack. Oh, really yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, like I said, I still... If anyone's ever had an injury where, I don't know, Achilles, whatever, you I can s- hear I it. I snapped my humerus could you, in could, half. Did you hear it? Oh, mate, yeah, it's minging. It's horrible. It's minging, yeah. And you can't explain it to people, the, the, the sensation of it either, like... You'd think it would be like, I don't know. You can't explain it. It is just a crack. And then you, my, my mates were like, oh, you dislocated your shoulder again. And I was like, I fucking broke my arm, boys. And you, you just know, don't you? It's yeah. gone. You know what I mean? You just know. Yeah. I mean, I've broke my arm as well. Like you can see. Oh, that's, fucking you know, hell. That's, a that's another mate. story. That's not as good a story. That was <laughs> inno- really innocuous, boring. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I, when I did the leg, I was 10 on the, on the school playground. Um, had the whole works like as well guy came in not not he actually sent me a a really nice message a few years later when i started playing table tennis and whatnot and basically was like you know i made you i made you disabled <laughs> funny, really. Cheers, mate. He, at the time he felt really bad because he he came in to tackle me but it wasn't it wasn't his fault at all um just one of those where ball dragged back and i again kids football isn't it it was quite rough and rough and ready whatever like I basically did the splits and I can't do the splits. <laughs> not the, yeah. And my leg just went back behind, snap, boom. Um, obviously everyone knew what had happened in straight away. Um, yeah. And in, yeah, I still remember, like you say, that's funny how we, like all the points of high emotion and trauma, you sometimes like you, you just don't remember it. It's all a blur. Like I think there's a lot of times in my life where things are a blur and this, this one is absolutely vivid. Like, I was on the playground, like the the school dinner lady basically came and held my leg in place. It was obviously, I didn't want to look. Yeah, still remember the sight of my leg just like poking off in all different directions. Anyway, um, yeah, got air ambulance straight to Derriford, grew up in Plymouth. Um, And I guess the rest is history, I suppose. That was when it was my first real setback, I suppose. I felt a bit invincible before that. Like my my older brother Eamon doing everything that he used to do, and I could no longer do that. And that was that was my first kind of right. I'm disabled. I can't do what my brother can do. Yeah. I can't do what my mates can do. Um, that was hard. Yeah. Um, so yeah. so prior to that, you said that was was ten. So were there any symptoms of your condition prior to that that were limiting or, yeah. or nothing? Yeah. So my my condition's genetic. So genetic mutation at birth. I used to know. I did chemistry degree, and I used to know all the. That's why I did a chemistry degree again. Like shaped my life so much. I used to know the exact chromosome and all the genetics and all the chemistry about it. But <laughs> I can't remember now. Um, but uh, they didn't diagnose me till I was about five or six. They just didn't know what it was. Um, the most immediate concern was my heart. So I was a blue baby basically I was leaking deoxygenated blood into oxygenated chambers for all intents and purposes probably the easiest way of saying it um and they thought maybe I had achondroplasia maybe I was, I was a, um, a dwarf and yeah that's one of the symptoms that's why I'm quite short um I feel like I feel like that and enables me to accept my disability more and 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 have you know some men are quite conscious over height aren't they I've never really cared that much it's almost like I've got a valid reason does that make sense? But it comes back to accepting it and everything. Um, and yeah, so I had all these, you, you suggest, um, touched on it before, the, the metal cage. So that basically put loads of pins through my leg. Um, so when it snapped, um, they rebroke it so it would grow back together. So the, the pins and the cage basically held it all in place so that it could regrow, re knit, but it just didn't work. It was just like I had so many of those metal cages to try and realign the joint, realign the bone. It just, kept growing back wonky and wonky so yeah it's it's almost like synonymous with me now like wonky <laughs> like but i love it now it's, mm. it's it's class like it's almost become a thing where i've done so many cool things it's given me an opportunity to overcome these hurdles overcome these battles to the point where it's like yeah wonky can he can do anything you know like, and I, I love that like gives me sometimes you don't feel like you can do everything mm. right but i've got this kind of built up 
this like fortress in the mind, impenetrable fortress where I'm like, yeah, he can do that. It's almost like I've got an alter ego, you know, it's class. Um, yeah, anyway, waffling on. No, that's good, mate. And then I guess, you know, we, we've all been teenage boys and growing up, you know, like self-identity and image and, and everything else is, is a, a big deal, isn't it? And obviously you, you now had this leg break, you've had these issues and you're kind of going into your teenage years. Like what, what were those years like for you? This is where enter table tennis, you know? I, my dad used to play table tennis, basically. <clears throat> I used to think it was a bit rubbish. Not gonna lie. Like I used to, like I said, play football and all, all that kind of kind of thing. And yeah, table tennis was something that my dad played, something that he was good at. I, in my you know infancy, like just vaguely remember thinking it was a bit rubbish. <laughs> but then when obviously I could no longer play football and do all those things, I had to, I had to play table tennis. That was the only thing, pretty much, that I feel like I could do at the time. Um, and I loved it from the from the very start. I wish I started when I was younger, to be honest. Um, I think that's everything in life for everyone. Having a, a goal, a purpose, something to get up in the morning. Um, and that's still the hardest thing for me every day, just getting up in the morning. Like, I have to remind myself all these things. Like, it's like a mental kind of meditative kind of routine where I have to, like, come on. Yeah. Um, anyway, we can get on to that again. It's opened up so many doors in terms of learning and opportunities. Um, the Paralympics, obviously... I didn't really know what the Paralympics was when I was 10. You know, I didn't play table tennis to, to qualify for a Paralympics. I played because rehabilitation, I could do something again. I could get better at it. Um, and how, also, how often did you play when you were like growing up through those periods? Where... From the age of 10 till I, I, reti- I obviously went on to play professionally till I retired when I was 31. Probably didn't, the longest I went without playing was probably three or four days. Mad that, isn't it? When I think, think, when I think about it now, and I don't play so much now. I'm like, and how long would you play for? Would it be like, like would you go to like a club after, sc- school, yeah, after so, school sort of thing? Yeah. So having a dad that played obviously helped. Um, was he, good? he coached the local. I, I used to think he was God, honestly. God tier. Yeah. Dad, yeah. Up here. That's yeah. What, that's, that's <laughs> you do though, don't you? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like I could never beat them at my, my, I say them like my brother, my sister, my dad, never going to beat them at hundred meter sprint, never going to beat them at tennis or whatever. But I could, I had a sniff at table tennis, you know, I, I could use my brain. I could make up for my limitations with my brain and like the speed of it. I was addicted to it genuinely, like in terms of just being the best, I think, I think any, you know, anyone who's got that, I just want, I'm so competitive with my older brother. I think that was everything. And then table tennis became my platform where I could almost prove myself. I think Mm -hmm. it's probably the easiest way of saying it. Um, and then later on, as I got better, then obviously London won the bid for the London 2012, opened up so many opportunities. Now I realized it was a Paralympics, started playing a few competitions, but it was, so I was probably played a good four or five years with just getting good, just in able-bodied table tennis. I was pretty good, played for Devon, able-bodied. That's why I loved it. It made me feel like I wasn't this guy who couldn't do things. Mm. I could now do things, you know, it was class. Um, yeah, I don't know where I'd be if I didn't play table tennis. I'm sure there would have been something else, but mm. um, I think, yeah, I think you, you see this with anyone who has a like trauma in later life, an injury. Like I th- they have to go through all of that growth immediately. Like that's hard. Like I did that over a long period of my childhood. Eight. Well, you could argue you're always growing, aren't you? I did have a bit of a chip on my shoulder when I was younger. I think in terms of being disabled, being the little disabled kids, you know, but maybe that makes me who I am. I wanted to prove myself always. So yeah. And table tennis was my chance. It was my opportunity. Um, I think it helps. That I was good at it as well. Obviously mm-hmm. you're going to enjoy it. If you're, if you're good at something, you, it feeds your passion. It feeds your motivation, doesn't it? Um, so yeah. And the sacrifice to be good at it becomes less because you love it. Yeah. You're good at it, you know, and you can concentrate on it. Yeah. Yeah, and then table tennis is a sport, and and I feel terrible saying this in front of you now, but I'm always teasing my other half because she's she likes playing table tennis, and that's not a sport. But <laughs> obviously, in preparation, this I watched some footage of you playing and 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 tennis t- uh, table tennis in general, and it's fucking quick. Like, what yeah. what are the the kind of um, I guess what are the sort of physical attributes that you need for that? Is it is it sort of demanding on the cardiovascular system? Is it reactions like speed? Yeah, reactions quick, fast twitch fibers. You have to be strong. You have to be fit. It's a leg sport, really, okay. which I didn't know about then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, obviously with your 
martial arts and whatnot and weight transfer efficiency of movement, um, all your power comes from your rotation. Yeah. So abdominals um, and at a high level, you do go quite far back from the table. Yeah. You're not supposed to. You want to try and stay as close as possible to lessen the time that, you know, the reactions for your opponent. But um, I mean, we can talk all day long about table tennis tactics, but um, that's that's why I love it because it's like a fast game of chess. Like I didn't have to move if I was clever. You know, if I put a specific spin on the ball, the angles, close down the angle, I, I knew where the ball was going before it went there. Like I was good at that. Um, and serving, like I was really good. Like serving, you're in complete control, aren't you? The nuances, the the little things you can do where you don't have to move that much. You see it in football, like the best footballers, they don't have to move. They're, they're there before it's, you know, they're two steps ahead of the game. And it's probably the easiest way of explaining for table tennis as well. Um, obviously, the quicker you are, the faster you are, the stronger you are, the easier it's going to be. So I was, everything growing up for me was just about becoming faster and stronger. Um, yeah. And I, I'm, I was fortunate. I was lucky. I, I I got there at a good time where London 2012 and, and everything and the, the being a Paralympian or a person with a disability doing sport in, mm. in the UK, it's, it was a blessing to be in in GB like the the kind of opportunities to be had as a British athlete and in that pathway growing up you know in other countries they don't have that so absolute blessing what sort of support do you get for that so I got onto the pathway when I was 15 um I, I played my first international at 15 uh in Norway June the 12th 2005 mad that I still remember that isn't it um it's weird. I shouldn't say this, but some of my internet passwords are like specific dates and stuff that I remember. I've changed yeah, that one. Right? <laughs> I've long changed that one, but yeah. We'll just beep, that, we'll just beep it out. Beep. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, any 15 year old, you know, playing for their oh, country, no, no matter what it is. Hell, like, yeah. You'd never forget that. Like, it's, not, it's not weird that you would remember that. You know? Yeah. Just getting the kit as well. There's very few people in ever that play for their country in anything. You know, there's very few. Yeah. I had an unbelievable career unbelievable career like um we can whistle stop tour it quickly if you want yeah like, do it. so yeah 15 played my first international and then um it was my like picked up from school by my coach my coach was actually i need to give him a shout out actually paul whiting um plymouth guy ex-international table tennis player very lucky in that sense like we had an unbelievable generation almost like a golden generation above us to then feed the next generation and then i think the generation come in under now that we're practicing with and I'm coaching are going to even be even better again. So um, I just wish we had a Paralympic, like a someone, like again, being, having a disability is an unbelievable opportunity. It's a good thing, I think. Like there's a kid with a disability in Plymouth who wants to get good at table tennis. That's a that's a class opportunity. There's so many good players down here um, to nurture you and, and guide you. And I was lucky because I had my coach, he worked in the dockyard. I used to get the ferry. I lived in Point, so I got the ferry across my mum would drop me at the ferry. I'd go on the passenger and he'd pick me up the other side after dockyard hours, literally train with the group of kids and the adults, like big training group in literally every day. I mean, I was lucky really. And I've got, you know, I'll, my parents are unbelievable. They ferried me everywhere, literally. Um, so that, that particular period of my life was all table tennis and all my mates were table tennis. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, some school friends, like, and whatnot that are still close to me but my passion and my you know it was just tables i literally look back at my childhood it's like yeah table tennis <laughs> <Isn't> <laughs> it? It um and then i qualified for beijing which was kind of a bit of a not a surprise i was I snuck in on the actually last tournament in 2007 it we flew to um chicago on christmas day i had to win basically the tournament to qualify and it was a lesser tournament. It was the US Open, but it wasn't so big. Um, basically, all the people who were not yet qualified, last chance saloon almost. Um, so that was quite a lot of pressure. I remember it. But I kind of went in with, I guess, um, nothing to lose, I suppose. It's, it's, it's a good freedom of mind. I try and live like that now, like Memento Mori, like already dead just go and live your life properly. Like I've had that with, I think I always practice like stoic traits without really consciously realizing it, um, especially in sport and sports psychology that helps me deal with my disability. We Again, we can get onto the psychology of things much more 
in a minute, but um, had to win this tournament, nothing to lose. And, and I went and won it and qualified for Beijing. So that was obviously Beijing 2008. Um, played Beijing. How'd you get off? I, I lost in the quarters. So yeah, not bad. Well, what, what you said it then, I thought you were going to say like, yeah, yeah. first match gone. Well, <laughs> we can fast forward. I've never won, I never won a Paralympic medal, which was probably, I was world number two for like nigh on a decade, over a decade. It was world number two? Yeah. And um, at what point do you just want to like, I don't know, hire a hitman or something? Yeah, like for number one. <laughs> yeah, fair one. Um, it was just frustrating because I, I won the European Championships a couple of times. I won um, a world medal. It's the timing of life. I suppose. Everything is timing in life. And I look back and I think, ah, it is a bit of a black mark on my copybook. But then you can't have any regrets. And I think you have to have the philosophy in life of, doing the right thing, nothing else matters. And I did the right thing. And just sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But if you've done the right thing, then you can't have any qualms, can you? Mm -hmm. And that's so applicable to anything. Um, yeah, like that came right before London, which was annoying. Um, I was probably a bit young in Beijing. Again, good performance, quarterfinals. Um, Rio was my big chance, 2016. Um, I'd slipped out of the top, again, injury. I didn't play a tournament for maybe nine months before Rio because I was injured. So I'd slipped out the top four. So I'd lost my semi-final seeding. So I was fifth seed, um, ended up playing the world, the top seed in the quarterfinals, had match point on him and eventually lost. Again, that's one point in my career, my match point on him that I look back and think, ah, could I have done something differently, you know? But I don't think, I, I don't think it was the best point of the match. Didn't, do anything wrong again sometimes you win sometimes you lose don't you you can't you can't regret things and if it's reasoned and calculated and the choices you make are beautiful choices then you can't have any qualms can you so mm -hmm. just a bit bit a bit annoying <laughs> but no all good i guess you do have one thing that they don't know mate don't you which is the uh, the most viewed fucking shot in forgot about that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, i fucking seen that shot it was ridiculous yeah. it? when when did you hit that so that was in London 2012. That was the last 16 match, I think, or roundabout. And, um, but you know the backstory now. You know I had a broken arm not too long before. Mm -hmm. And obviously I dived onto that arm. Yeah. yeah. That was a pure, I don't know how else to, how else to say it, but that was a pure fuck it moment. <laughs> that is, sometimes you have to take a risk in life. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned, again, table tennis is very symbolic, metaphorical for a lot of things. And shot selection everything like i was getting to the point in my career where i used to be a bit flash i used to be talented worked hard but didn't quite put it all together um and probably london 2012 is a good example of that i didn't perform to where i maybe should have done i used to get real nervous real nervous and that's why i did a lot of work on that and the, the sports psychology side of things I got in my later career got really good at dealing with that but at, at that point in time things were were I was starting to lose momentum a little bit and I, I lost my head a little bit, but I guess when, when the ball is there and you've trained so hard, you can't, you practice for the moments, but you can't actually practice for them. If that makes sense, they just happen. They happen exactly how they should do. Um, and that moment in time was just pure shit or bust. <laughs> yeah. um, that is such a yeah. shot. Such a shot, wasn't it? Well, even just catching the, the shot in the first place was pretty epic. But then the actual shot itself, with my limited knowledge of, of table tennis, looked yeah. looked awesome. Yeah, it, it was, was right, on the, right on the edge of the table. It bounced, didn't it? I remember it. It's completely different in my head to how it actually looks. You know, like, <laughs> you, know when you, you hear your voice back and it sounds nothing yeah. like what you think. It, like, yeah. That looks nothing like what in my head it looked like at the time. I vaguely, like, I obviously remember it quite well. In my vague memory now, I just remember thinking tactically, I was forced in my hip. And that's a bit of a weakness of mine. I can't go that way that quick because my bad leg is my left leg. So they used to pin me in my hip quite a lot to get me per four on there. And then I'm struggling. Um, so I was like, well, I'm, I'm screwed here, aren't I? So I just remember thinking, oh, if I just get a bit of, get wrap my wrist around it, then I can get a bit of kick on it so that it'll, it'll get the angle away from the table. Yeah, that doesn't look like what it looks like in my head. But oh, I'll take it though. <laughs> yeah, is that the is that the best shot you've ever done? Oh, like really competitively? Nah, I've done 
that's the best shot I've done on camera with commentary with a replay and everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I used to do quite a few st silly shots. Yeah, I'd be on the floor all the time. Yeah, there's a reason I'm disabled. <laughs> <I'll take it. laughs> um, no, I used to love diving about, but that's uh, you have to right do or die. You got nothing will stop you from letting that ball go past you. It's just like an instant reflect. You know, reflexes. Mm. You train your subconscious. You don't have time in table tennis to think about it. Mm. Like I said, you, you you have more time than you think because, you know, body positioning, the spin you've got on the ball, the way the angles are, you, you kind of have a vague idea where the ball's going before it's gone there. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's very, you know, autopilot. You have to have thousands and thousands of balls to be able to train the way to think. Like you think pure, ta you don't want to be thinking about how to hit a ball when you play. Muscle memory. Yeah, you want to be thinking about where do I need to put this? Mm -hmm. Three or four shots ahead. Like, yeah, I'm saying this now in hindsight thinking, yeah, I used to do that, but now it's like, like cry, coach the kids now. And yeah, I'm injured within two minutes. It's, like, it's quite <laughs> slightly depressing, but yeah. And then you kind of obviously mentioned the heart condition as well. Did that, would did that offer any limitations throughout your career at all? Or did that not affect? affect I got a pacemaker. Okay. So I had an irregular heartbeat for quite a bit when I was growing up and they were a bit worried about it. It got repaired when I was 11 months old. Okay. So got sewn up and et cetera, et cetera. Regular checkups. Um, I've had a few episodes where I've passed out. Faint. You know, you hear about this, like these scary stories of footballers like dropping down. Like, mm -hmm. it does worry me a little bit, but I've almost got an insurance policy now with the, the pacemaker. Okay. Yeah. So, so, when, so when did that go in? So that went in when I was 14, 15, right, okay. which is quite young for a pacemaker. But um, yeah, like doesn't really affect me other than that. It's made me very health conscious. Yeah. Uh, maybe in the back of my mind growing up, but certainly now more to the forefront of my mind. Like, again, all my experiences in terms of being a table tennis player has now transferred into pushing myself and becoming an absolute machine. And maybe in the back of my mind, that's all shaped because I need to stay in shape. Uh, they actually were going to put a, a micro pacemaker into my heart. Okay. So a little this at the moment has wires going into my heart down the veins um but they wanted there's a new one which goes inside your heart and pulses so it doesn't it's wireless basically which is a little bit more safer and the risks of wires going down veins and into the heart and perforating the heart and all that kind of thing it, it kind of removes all that so i've they found out that my heart needed more energy to more electrical impulse to um keep it beating so i've now got more wires down a vein than a advisable or something like that i don't know if there's any doctors like going to watch this back they're probably going to be critical of what i'm saying but that's what as far as i understand it like i i need to keep my arteries and my veins like relatively unblocked and um, unclogged if that makes sense yeah, so yeah. yes yeah, it's, it's kind of does enter my brain now especially yeah as you get older you don't feel as indestructible as you used to and, and what prompted that to be to be done at 15 years old was there an incident or an event before that or was it just part of that process that you knew it was going to happen sooner no later? no just yeah regular checkups they pick up picked up you know one of these little bits and pieces yeah, yeah. yeah. i guess everyone should have a heart checkup at some point especially yeah. if you're active yeah um and i put my heart through some some turmoil now i suppose but yeah so it it won't go below a certain heart rate my heart now it will kick in yeah but it can go as high as it wants. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. So there's different kind of types, isn't there? So. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then I want to tap into this, this sports psychology stuff. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we've kind of touched on it and alluded to it a couple of times and we're, we're living in today's world where, you know, people really struggle with purpose. It seems like everybody doesn't have any fucking stoicism anymore. Soft and, as fuck. Yeah, and certainly for men. <laughs> I mean, mental health, suicide is, is just off the chart, certainly yeah. in the West. So yeah, I mean, let's dig into that, mate, because yeah. I feel like you're an absolute fucking expert in this, this stuff. This is, like I said, experience is the greatest teacher. It's given me, I call it a talent. It's not a talent, is it? It's, you've, it's a long period of, well, shit, as we say, of things <laughs> happening in life, which enable you to be able to deal with things. And it, I guess it's rooted in, you know, choose not to feel harmed and you won't feel harmed, don't feel harmed and you haven't been. That's easy to say, easy to go on then. <laughs> But in reality, it's not as easy as that, is it? Um, and I, f I, I think I flip it on its head now. I, like, like I said, every morning I wake up, everyone wakes up, they're a bit stiff, you know, they're a bit like, God, I can hardly move. Busy day training yesterday, whatever. Like every day I wake up and I, my bones are like concrete. And that's, 
it is painful. And I, I didn't want this to sound like a sob story, but it's hard. It is hard. The hardest thing I do is getting out of bed in the morning. Um, but I have to have an internal dialogue and I get kicks out of it now. And that, it's like, you know, don't don't feel, you know, choose not to feel the pain and you won't feel the pain. Like that's an internal, but I like the pain now. I have to like it because it's always going to be there and you have to accept any situation you're in. And I get a bit of a kick out of it, genuinely, like a perverse kind of enjoyment because the harder it is, the better, you know, you know, that principle, like, come on then, I'm fucking aching today. Let's go. Let's have it. <laughs> I, you know, I have to weirdly psych myself up for it. Do you have a routine in the morning that you do to, to kind of loosen yourself up or? Um, not necessarily physically, more mentally. Like, you know, like I think everyone goes through this, don't they? But this, this is why it, yeah. I Massively. find it easier now than I ever used to. And I'm probably in more pain now than I've ever been, which is weird because I can do more now than I ever used to be able to do because I've got to the point where I can push myself through those barriers. When I retired from table tennis, like, it was purely because of my pain. I couldn't move. My hip had gone. I was in a bad place and I lost all my mental strength. Like my purpose, my passion, all my goals, everything were gone. That's that I was in a bad place, like a real bad place. And I think most people, if not ev like everyone's been in a place in their life where they've been a bit low and they've not felt as mentally strong. And I think you're lying if you, you say you, you haven't had that because, and whatever scale or whatever spectrum is, that was the bottom of my bottom. Um, I'd lost my job effectively. That was my livelihood, everything. And I couldn't be mentally strong every day. I didn't have that purpose. I didn't have that goal. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have the ability to wake up and have, right, fucking come on then. Um, and I've been there like, and it took, I was the hardest period of my life where I've overcome that. And that's why I feel like I can get up and talk about my routine now. Memento Mori, you know, I feel like I have already died and that's gone like now i can properly live because i've got another opportunity now where i've overcome all that and i know what it feels like to not be able to do things how can you not get addicted to getting up and getting in the sea and running up mountains and running marathons and okay it's not tail tennis anymore but it's it's life you know that for me is easy to get up it's easy now it's easy to push through the barriers easy to to you know give me the pain come on then like, you know, that's probably the easiest way of explaining it. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. We had a, uh, a former guest who was an ex-professional fighter at a very elite level. And he talked about um, that athletes, certainly elite athletes, kind of die twice. He said the exact same thing. It was Luke. Yeah, he did, yeah. And yeah, exactly that, where you create this whole identity around your sport. And then when that goes, you, you kind of almost die this like public death where that's not you anymore. Yeah. And then you obviously don't. You see, you you see it with footballers and everything, don't they? Tend to gamble. I look in back and now and I think you live in a bubble. I have lots of chats with ex-athletes, and every every single one has gone through this mental kind of cycle. Um, yeah, you do live in a bubble. It's not real life, really, is it? You're a manifestation. You're li everyone's living their own life, aren't they? It's a manifestation of how you want to view things, and that's why you have an unbelievable power over your thoughts and your feelings. And you know, it's all perspective, isn't it? Yeah. And you have you can change your perspective, you yeah. Know, actually, yeah, change how you th think and view things. Therefore, you have a power over whatever you want it to be. Well, you, we all know how, what it's like being around like someone who's really negative all the time, and how they make you feel after a certain amount of time. And then when you're not around them for a while, you think, ah, you know, I mean, it's a bit better. And that negativity can really like I don't know, it's, it sucks a life out of you, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And it's really easy as well to get into that mindset of negativity. It's a lot harder to be positive. It's hard to recognize them. I oh think, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, like nerves, anything, any anxiety. Like you having these thoughts and feelings without even knowing it. And a negative person doesn't know they're being negative sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I, I call people out now. I'm quite harsh and ruthless in my older age. Like not that I'm old, but in my older post athlete age, where I wish I'd just, you know, just said it how it is. Being honest is powerful, and accepting a certain situation is powerful because only when you accept it and you recognise what you're going through, and you can kind of articulate your thoughts then you can deal with them like it's everything i think um yeah i think that's the basis of all psychology isn't it just yeah. knowing exactly the situation and being honest with it as well it's hard to be honest in emotional situations yeah. to think logically that's the key just thinking logically under high stress pressure that's hard but you have to 
again, experience. You can't know how you react unless you've been through it, unless you've been through those challenges. It's almost like the next challenge that comes along, that um, you'd be ready for it, wouldn't you? You're expecting it and you know how to react and you, oh, it's fine, away we go. Easy as that, <laughs> in theory. No, yeah. 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 It, does, it does diminish the impact of it when it does come. Because you, you know, you read you. If you're expecting, uh, you know, running a marathon, for example, I knew at one point in that I would want to quit. I'd have those thoughts. I wasn't going to quit, but I knew I would have those thoughts. And if you're not expecting them, and you're not ready for me, you're not been there before. You're, like, oh, I quit. Go whatever. I've never been that person, but you train your mind to be able to just instantly recognise it, and then tell it to piss off. <laughs> Is that, does that make sense? Even just doing any old workout in the gym, oh, it hurts. Yeah, 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 it hurts. Class, recognize it, accept that, tell it to piss off and away you go. I think that's why we love jujitsu so much because it puts you through so much shit constantly. You get so used to the shit that most of everyday life becomes so fine <laughs> because the, the hardest part of your day will be jujitsu, getting chinned by someone. <laughs> Maybe I should start playing, yeah. Started doing some jiu jitsu. Oh, mate, yeah. do it. If you, yeah, if you like the grunt and make thing, it's you, you honestly like it's like cuddle therapy, mate. You love it. It's fucking amazing. But we say it all the time like, I think physical adversity, whether it's table tennis, jiu jitsu, anything, it, it seems to dial down like the, the sort of normal stresses of everyday life. I think 100%. What do you think? Um, what do you think you kind of learn more from your, your disability or your sport and your competing? It's all the same literally so interlinked and intertwined being able to deal with pressure dealing with being able to overcome pain that's all the same thought processes really and and that applies to anyone um it's almost like a special blueprint i've got to just oh shit happens come on then how do i mentally overcome that because it's all mental and that's what i love about it that's what i love about pushing yourself, running marathon, and that's not physical. None of it's physical. If you can take one step, you can take a thousand steps. Mm. I think like that, like, okay, it might get harder, but yeah, one step over and over again. And if you break things down into little kind of little goals, little hurdles, then eventually the overall magnitude of that end goal is kind of, you, you're there before you know it. Um, yeah, I, that's try and, That's how I try and think. Yeah. Um, the, 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 I'm curious to see what you think about the, the, the transition from how long's a how long's a game of table tennis typically? Not that long actually, half, half an hour or so. Yeah. So I'm interested to see how uh, how you found the transition from like a 30 minute sport to like well, what's your world record? Like six hours? Yeah. Something. Yeah. Because I, I know I've I've you know done a you know not to your level by any means, mate. But I've you know competed in MMA and I've competed in jujitsu and I've you know sort of had some really tough workouts. So I've been in some really kind of uh, tough physical situations, so we say, and I've done jiu-jitsu for years. But I think probably the hardest thing that I did uh, was the Oxfam Trail Walker, which is uh, 100 kilometers or 62, 62 miles. And you've got like uh, 30 hours to complete it. So you do it in a one-up. And I've actually done it twice because the first time I did it, I pulled out at 90K. And the next day I woke up, I felt such shame. And I felt so disgusted that I went back like two years later and did it. And exactly what you said, where I then was able to, when it got tough, as it did, despite the fact it's only walking, when you're walking for that amount of time, it, 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 it I think compounds. doing anything, like knitting for 12 hours, you probably are. When your fingers start bleeding, you're like, fuck yeah. yes. <laughs> but I was, I was able to do exactly what you said, where I was able to, to think about last time that I felt this pain and I pulled out and then how I felt. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's so relevant. But how did you find that? Because for me, the, just the length of time that you've got yeah. to sit in your head and deal with that adversity is so different to, to half an hour, yeah, 10 minutes. Know, yeah. But you could argue that I was going through it all day, every day anyway, mm. in terms of just being up and about on my feet. Sure. Was, yeah, I, again, I don't want it to sound like a sob story, but I'm literally in pain now. Like, but I don't know, is it pain? Like, could you, if I put you in my body now, that sounds weird. Would you be it. in the same pain that I'm in? I don't know. It's a, this is a, yeah. Mm. Oh, no, I know. It's one know. of those, isn't it? I think we would, mate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just being comfortable with being, disc that's why I love the ice swimming. And that's why I love, you know, the transfer into all the endurance stuff. Mm. Is there that's anything that you do it. that really like helps you perform? 
because obviously you're doing like a lot of like exercise now. You, you yeah. just mentioned like ice bath, then you do a lot of like recovery work with that yeah. sort of stuff and saunas and yeah, yoga, yoga, yoga. Uh, nice you know what I mean, like all that yeah. type of stuff. Absolutely, I'm big into it. I wish I was into it when I was playing table tennis still, like literally, just table tennis and gym. And I was always into the fitness, like aside from the table tennis, yeah. and it weirdly gave me a real mental kick, like a real a trigger in a match where I think if you focus on something, it even if it's just one tactic, even if that tactic is rubbish, like it's a wrong tactic, <laughs> if you're focused on it, it yeah. removes all other headspace from anything negative. Mm. Um, and that's a real powerful tool. And for me, it was always fitness, right? I'm an animal. I'm Van Wetherill. Like I, you know, just come up, you know, juice in the deciding set, whatever match point down, just prove how much of an animal I am right now. Like, I'm going to go stronger. I'm going to not drop before he drops. I'm going to do everything. Like I'm going to rotate on my forehand. I'm going to get down low on my legs. I'm going to absolutely explode this backhand. Like thinking like that just removed all of the negativity. And it was, that was my way of doing it. Like I was fitter than, I was the fittest table tennis player. I mean, it's not for me to say, but I, I think I was. Well, I've, I was, let's be honest. <laughs> let's be honest. Um, and I got a lot of positive confidence from that. So it was, it was quite easy to then transfer that into other things um but you know that's all about but it's the mental side of things like that's why i like the endurance stuff and obviously metaphorically climbing mountains and and doing all the the crossfit and high rocks and ice swimming it that's all a mental game um that's why i love it so much like it was um yeah no it's quite easy to do that what was the original question i can't remember it, it was yeah. it was the, it was that it was a trans yeah it was a transfer from going from like um you know sort of 30 minutes of of, of yeah. competing to to hours and hours so that that kind of switching mindset I guess from one to the other but I think you kind of answered it when you said that I, I kind of live it every second of the day but it's I've, this is my mum has a go at me I, I, I'm a 34 year old man now actually she's like still it's like, <laughs> yes I can't do that every day I can't run a marathon every day like that's an extraordinary event like I still look back at me how the hell did I do that like however many thousands of 60,000 dips or whatever it is like when you put it like that, it sounds class and everything. And yet I still struggle to go and do the shopping when I'm tired. Mm. I can't put my shoes and socks on. Like it's hard to motivate yourself for the mundane things sometimes. Mm. Like obviously it is like, I don't know. Yeah. But like since my hip problems, like it really hurts for me to bend down and put my shoes and socks on. Like imagine like psyching yourself up just to put your shoes and socks on. That's harder to do than I can psych myself up to run a marathon and run a mountain. Yeah fair but yeah that's that's hard more day to, to day things. i have to recalibrate my brain, brain sometimes and actually think no this is hard for me and you know i do need to kind of practice what i preach sometimes um because it's not all rosy posy like yeah and some you do need people to help you sometimes you can't do it all by yourself when you are in the doldrums of of despair and you are being a bit negative which is normal absolutely normal and you sometimes need your mates and the people around you to remind yourself and scrape the barrel a little bit. Like when I was in hospital, I didn't, I need to remind myself now if, cause that will come again. I need my left hip is dangling off at the moment, another story. And I do need my left hip doing, and I'll be in the doldrums of in a hospital bed, not being able to do all the things that I like to do and prove myself. You have to remind yourself that there is a light at the end of the tunnel in those moments. And you don't feel like it is at the moment. But you just have to remind yourself, even if you don't feel like it, there's always a way of scraping the barrel to find a positive headspace and get that positivity back. And sometimes you need people to help you. I, I you know, again, we touched on Sam who did the, Sam did the marathon with me, Sam Brutty legend. We should give him a shout out. He's the most relentless man I've ever met in my life in terms of having a mindset like mine, like, I'll wake up in the morning and my brain's there, but my body's not quite there sometimes. And he's like, always there, like 6 a.m., let's go. You need that sometimes. Yeah, you like, do, yeah. And that's a, yeah. That's accountability, that's a isn't it? It's huge. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, went off on one again. <laughs> no, that's fine, mate. Um, we've kind of like skirted around your marathon. I think we should probably yep. just touch on it just to clarify for, for people that are listening what you actually achieved there. Yeah, so... Uh, in the back, let's reverse back to coming back out of hospital and my rehab and not being the animal that I used to be. And I had the vision of, I didn't think I could ever walk again. I was that bad. Hospital for what? Your hip? For my hip. After yeah. after table tennis. Yeah, I had a full hip replacement. 
Um, and I cracked it a few times and I fractured it and it was setback after setback. And I was like, this is going to be me now for the rest of my days. I put on quite a bit of weight. Um, I couldn't walk and I'd let myself go mentally. I was, it was always there, but I didn't care anymore. I'd lost the care. Like I was empty. You know, I didn't have table tennis to, that was always my kick up the ass. Or I need to, you know, I didn't have that anymore. And I, I was lost. Um, and I promised myself like a, yeah, I vividly, like vividly remember, I remember just like a switch in my brain. One day I was like, I'm going to do the half marathon, Plymouth half marathon. I'm going to run up Snowden because I'd done that before. And I, it was my dream to do it again and be back to the person I used to be. And this has nothing to do with physical. This is just myself mentally. Like I'm going to be that person again. Um, and Sam basically saw me do that marathon. It was about four or five months after my hip replacement. It wasn't like, it wasn't that long. That's after my, I did probably the fastest ever rehab. I lost like 20 kilos in stupidly short amount of time. I think. <laughs> um, it, yeah. Once you get that switch on, boom, it's on. And I think, um, Sam saw me do that half marathon and, and he said that was when his switch went he's like i want to do some mad stuff with that guy and it was always his dream to break the the marathon world record the unofficial crutch marathon world record i didn't i i i almost dismissed it in my brain because that half marathon was nearly killed me at that time i was like there's no way i could do that again on you know I, that's double that obviously yeah at that point zero percent of me ever thought i'll do a marathon but then as you know like i say you break down chunk by chunk every day you just relentlessly accountable you just live your life like that eventually these goals seem manageable and it got to the point where maybe i can do a marathon yeah maybe i can so um and again like medi raising money having that purpose purpose is everything having a reason that's strong enough if your reason is stronger than the obviously well-known path of life for everyone like if that reason is stronger than than the pain or the hurdle that you you're up against then you will overcome it for sure you just have to have that why strong enough and medi kind of with the raising money for jdrf gave us that why and making so many friends and the camaraderie the community like i'll be lying if i, I had it in me obviously but i'll be lying if i said it didn't make it a little bit easier um so maybe now 1% of me thought I could do a marathon, not nothing to do with the record, just actually do the marathon. Um, and Sam, unbeknownst to me, applied to Guinness World Records, whatever, to, to break it. <laughs> he, told, he told me about it. And it was something I was going to aim for, but not officially. I was just going to do it and not make it official or ratify or whatever, anything like that, not tell anyone about it. Maybe that was me being a bit negative and a little bit like, you know, I wasn't being accountable for it. I just wanted to do it for me. It was obviously goes without saying it was quite close to me. That challenge was like personal and very emotional. Um, but yeah, he was like, nah, burn the boats. Let's go for it. You know, burn the boats. Don't, you know, don't give yourself any other option. Tell people that you're going to break the world record. And he went, Oh yeah. He went and basically told the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> So then I had to do it. Yeah. You know, I had That's to. Thing, isn't it? And still only probably, yeah, I'd say only 1% of me thought I could do that genuinely. But that 1% instantly, once you think 1%, that almost makes it 10% immediately straight away, isn't it? Um, yeah. Best thing I've ever done by, by a country 26 miles. <laughs> Was it the hardest thing you've ever done? Um, I've done a lot of hard things in my time. Um, back in my playing days, like, I cycled Tour de France Alps one-legged. That was quite hard. <laughs> I did, oh, the ice swim was hard. 24-hour ice swim. I've done that. What do you mean 24-hour ice swim? We did a relay 24-hour ice swim. That's a different kind of hard, though. That is pure. Anyone can swim in a ice pool, can't they? But being able to mentally just push yourself, Fuck that's a different that. kind of hard. That. Mate, that's disgusting. Like, that sounds... Yeah. <laughs> That's a I'm the runner, mate, challenge. but I'd rather run a marathon than do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. That's, that's stay on the marathon. We'll come straight yeah. back to that, though, because we'll so, know more about that. Um, I, th You know, you think you've emptied the tank, but you've always got a little bit more. You've always got... You can always scrape that barrel until... You can empty the tank so many more times after you initially think you've emptied the tank, I think. And um, 
I've never got myself to that stress. Yeah. Anyway, rewinding forward a little bit on the finish line, like straight to hospital, it was like, and I don't want to dramatize it more than it actually was because I felt okay, but not, yeah, I was real low blood pressure, um, real dehydrated, IV drip straight in. That's, yeah, a proper empty the tank. Like I've never emptied the tank like that before. And I remember distinctly thinking, it's it's a weird milestone, that halfway point where you've done the half marathon. And we kind of paced it meticulously to just slow and steady wins the race. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast the whole way. And got to the halfway point relatively okay i was in a lot of pain but nothing that wasn't manageable but you think that's a good mouse oh i got half but then it's so demoralizing because you got you know so exactly another the half pain. you know the distance you've just done you've got to do it all over again i remember thinking at halfway i was like <sighs> again like get that out of your brain straight away um and i said to sal i remember saying like this is this is going to get hard now like you're going to have to be an absolute bleep 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 to me like and i want it like you know me like it's almost telepathic the way we tr we train together every day now he knows my limitations like he knows when i'm done i was like if i'm not done i mean absolutely done as in i can't as in like you take my crutches away from me and i can't chase after you to get them back that's when i'm done like you have to corral my mental resilience everything the whole of the rest of this way because i'm struggling right now i remember think we got to about well 16k to go i remember it's all a bit of a blur that a lot of the journey and we we went to places you go to places in your brain when you're in that pain cave that you don't even know exist and all these epiphanies come out of nowhere and even the weeks afterwards i was like popping like thoughts and memories that we were spoke about and we were going around that we'd never spoke about before they only happen in times when you're under significant like duress and you're like in that proper pain cave. That's a real pain cave. And 16 K to go was when it came. Cause I remember, th I remember thinking, Oh, we've got 14 K to go where it was actually 16 and it happened the other way around as well. You, you, you're not thinking straight, like you're that exhausted. And I was, I was spent with 16 K to go. I was like thinking I had 14 K saw it six. Nah, I can't do this. Like I, genuinely yeah. vote that was the first time i'd verbalized you know said it out loud that wasn't me done but that was me thinking that i can't do this and yeah it was like that last 16k was again just we kind of wrote off the, the record thing because that was keeping me going to some extent we were always ahead of it and that's when we started to slow a little bit and i was like you know you got something chasing you now you slow in and I was in so much pain. I've never been in that much pain before. Um, I don't know how I did 16 more K, put it that way. You just, yeah, just one step over and over again. And eventually you're at the finish line. But it's weird, isn't it? How once you set a goal for yourself, that becomes the limit of what your body achieves. Because that was the finish line. That was my absolute, and I didn't actually stop running per se, or galloping, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> until about 200 meters from the line. I and mean, everyone, who was there waiting for me on the finish line basically came down a little bit 200 meters to go harrison and harry from actor the run club in plymouth flight i vaguely remember seeing them and um that's when i stopped for the first time 200 meters to go i was like you know well you're doing it's effective doing so many dips so many press-ups and my brain was always like carry on carry on carry on push the negativity away like it was almost like a constant battle that you have like over and over again that's when i genuinely couldn't do any more dips there comes a point where you just can't do it anymore. And um, so we paced it pretty much perfectly in that sense. But um, yeah, Mehdi was like counting me down five. Like if you stop, you stop for five seconds max. Um, yeah. And when I got to the finish line, that was that was me absolutely done. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. Because if, if the finish line had been another kilometer, maybe I would have had another kilometer in me, you know? Do you think it was actually seeing the finish line that, that caused that to almost like you to create, I don't know, like a moment of weakness in the brain well, or the body or whatever it was. The body achieves what the mind believes, isn't it? The, my mind was telling me that was the finish. So that was the f absolute finish for me. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, done. Absolutely done. <laughs> Straight to hospital, <laughs> which I wouldn't advise. Obviously, it's it's it was all done safely. I was fine. 
I was um, about to say, yeah, I feel yeah, right. Like I, was, I, knew, I know my limits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but you don't really know your limits until you've really pushed them, right? So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fucking hell, mate. That's, that's unbelievable, it was, mate. It was class. Such and an again, achievement. I couldn't have done that without Sam, so... Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask, actually, do you think you could have ever done that without that peer support? I mean, who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I've got, everyone's got an ego, right? And I, I back myself to do everything that I do yeah. anyway. It's just nicer to do it with someone, isn't it? Would have been horrible yeah. to do that by myself. Oh, mate, yeah. Okay, no. Absolutely horrible. And maybe, I don't think, I'm not one to give up. So I don't think I would have given up but it's nice to have someone there to remind you, yeah. you know, and just, you know, you got this. That's yeah. everything in life. It is, mate. It's, it's so key. And, and going back to that that example that I offered with the, the trail walker that I did, when I pulled out at, at 90K, so it was a team of four and uh, the whole team had pulled out at this point by me. So I walked from 70 to 90K by myself um, and I got to 90K and one of my teammates who was still kind of on site had like, basically picked up the support crew duties and when I got to 90k I did what you did where I was like Matt I don't think I can do it and what I actually needed was a Sam to say yeah. fucking crack on mate <laughs> yeah. and what he actually said was oh it's all right mate you've done it better than everybody else you yeah. can stop if you want and I was like yep yeah, done bosh and I was out yeah it's an easy out isn't it yeah so I think having the, the right people around you yeah can definitely get you so much further absolutely I need that in my life yeah it it can be quite hard yeah yeah you've just reminded me of, yeah go on well it's like, talking about like uh, like ex girlfriends and stuff. I think I tend to kind of it's it's nice to have a nice caring girlfriend, a nice partner who is always there for you. I can't fault my ex girlfriend, for example. Like she was brilliant through. Like, she saw me through all the tran- like career transition, mm-hmm. but she was very much a caring. Ah, oh, you know, it's okay. You know, always there for me. What I actually needed was. can do this like not it's okay you know i don't know I'd, it's that's an, another like talking yeah, about no, psychology and right. stuff yeah, yeah, like but right. mate i think we obviously going back to the men's mental health thing i think this is uh, one of the big issues that you you see now um where where guys don't always get around other guys mm-hmm. you know and often you don't get that that level of um that, that level of kick up the ass from a female typically i mean some are, are, are badasses of course but as you say, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the sort of that, that kind of encouragement and enforcement you get from people is often from your mates. Yeah. Um, and yeah, again, it's, it's something that, you know, I've, I've always had the privilege of having because I've always done what well, for most of my adult life now I've done jujitsu. So I've always been around guys. Um, but I've had a couple of mates that have really had a wobble with their mental health. And it's always when they're isolated, when they haven't got people around them, like yeah. giving them a kick up the ass and saying, mate, get your fucking shit together. Don't they, be honest sometimes, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's you a lot of power a... in being honest in, honest in life, um, which is sometimes hard to hear, but mm. it's right, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely. Tell us about this fucking ice swimming, mate, because I've been sat here curious yeah, so, about it now. Yeah. Honking. I think, <laughs> you know, I go in the sea most days now. I think it's almost symbolic. It, A, helps my joints. Mm. Well, I think it helps my joints. It helps my muscles, which yeah. therefore helps my joints. Sure. Um, and that's why I'm another reason why I'm into the, the whole fitness thing. Like stability around my joints yeah. does lessen the pain that I have. Mm-hmm. And so I swim is a big part of that. And again, my, my disability is quite rare. There's not many people in the world with my disability. Didn't mention that. So I do get quite a few messages and I'm on the Wikipedia for people with this condition. That's like me completed life kind of thing for my disability. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, fuck everything else, fuck the world records yeah. and the Paralympics, <laughs> Wikipedia. <laughs> it's hard for me to offer advice per se. Like everyone is different at the end of the day. And specific, especially everyone with a disability, no two disabilities are the same, even if you've got the same condition as me. And I, you know, there's probably people who can do things that I can't do. Like, anyway, that's life, right? Um, but I've, what work has worked for me is, being in shape, being, you know, having that muscular stability, but it's hard to advise a kid with my disability, go and run a mountain, go and, you know, go and do all these things which are gonna cause you very short-term pain, like unbelievable amount of short-term pain to then be able to have less pain in the future. That's hard, like no doctor would ever advise to do what I do. Obviously I break the 
I blur the lines of good and bad pain or, you know, helpful pain and unhelpful pain sometimes. But like I said, I get kicks out of that and I can definitely do more now than I ever used to be able to do. But it's, it's hard for me to, you know, I'm not a medical professional. I can't. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, I swim in. <laughs> um, that, that, that's more mental for me. Like just learning to be mentally strong. That, that, it's almost easy for me because it's like nowhere near the hurdles that I've got to do to overcome the pain of my disability. I don't think just getting in a bit of cold water. So what was so it? What? It's just a bit cold, isn't it? Did you have to do it in a, as a team? Yeah. So, sorry, we, we've done, it's, um, done quite a few charity ice swims now. That's the only reason I got into it in the first place a couple of years ago through lockdown. It was all a bit of a craze, wasn't it? Um, I always used to go in the sea, but not religiously to the point where, yeah, I could take or leave the, the mental health benefits and all the meditative side of things. And, and while it was a physical thing for me, you know, do a bit of training, go swim in the sea. Um, but then I got addicted to the, the mental game. Like it's the same temperature for everyone. Okay. Acclimatization and everything. But as you start out, like that is the same for everyone. It's just whether or not you can not give up and not, you know, not overcome that hurdle of, Oh, it's a bit cold. Yeah, it is a bit cold. But again, it's only cold if you think it's cold. Like once you just, you know, if it's endurable, endure it. It's, temperature is easily endurable. That's not going to, okay, if you stay in there hours, fair enough, whatever. But um, that's how I got into all the, the breathing side of things. And, and that's really helped me. And yoga, like I've, I've done yoga for about a decade now. Um, I'm big into the breathing and just being in touch with the mind and the body. Like, I think that's really important for me. And again, why it's all interlinked with my disability. So, um, yeah, and, and ice water swimming is is a is a funny one, isn't it? Like everything's telling you to get out, but you're fine. You're absolutely fine. I think Ricky Bellingham's my funniest one I've seen getting off <laughs> <laughs> from such an odd bastard. Just like <laughs> that video fucking cracks me. So that challenge you did then, so that involved you getting in and out repeatedly. Sorry, yeah. yeah, I think that was what's hard about it. Yeah, you reach an equilibrium when you're staying in, don't yeah. you? But going out and getting back in again. So we basically you know, tagged in and out relay. There was 24 of us doing an hour each in, I can't remember what temperature it was. It was ice water territory. When you so say an hour each, you mean a continuous hour? No, no, or so it's 10, 10 minutes since we were doing yeah. Right. yeah, that was quite hard. It wasn't the hardest thing I've ever done, but hard in a different way because yeah. it was all mental. And were you actually swimming or just submerged? Yeah, I, well, I was swimming. Okay. Yeah. Of course I was swimming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I hear that's, that's harder again. Cause I think, um, I think Joe Rogan maybe talked about it or, or someone, but when people go in ice baths and they stay still, apparently though like, you insulate yourself somehow, but when you're actually moving and thrashing, it's, it's even colder again. So you just went, went for the hardest level every time. Mate, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And now I have, I have cold showers every morning now. Oh man, yeah. fuck that. Endorphins and everything i actually find cold showers worse than getting in the sea and, and even if it's lower temperatures it's like bullets of cold isn't i just it? can't do it i try it probably once in the summer when i'm really hot and i think yeah we'll have a cold shower and i'll start for about two seconds my dick goes inside me i reckon you should give it a go again <laughs> yeah hey i don't know <laughs> it's i think it's a good again like just give yourself something hard to do to overcome in the morning it could be anything <laughs> sets you up for it. I know it's a weird, perverse kind of backwards way of thinking. No, it's not that. I, I like, I love the idea of it. I love the idea of it. I love the idea of going sea swimming. I love the idea of doing all the stuff. I watch, I watch like, your, what's the group you got? Op or Operation, Operation Enrichment. <clears throat> yeah. All the stuff you're doing is great. I love it. But then when I actually think about actually getting in that sea, I'm like, fucking hell. Like, I don't know. I feel like it's, uh, we don't need it because we do jujitsu. Fair. That's, <laughs> that's, right. that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, we're we'll put ourselves through shit with that. I've had, to, you know, I've, I, my mate actually had a go at me the other day for being not. I'm not. I try not to be preachy as such, but I think it's really good. I think you should do it. But therefore, I mean, but I'm not I'll, like I'll preaching. Come in, I'll, yeah. come in, I'll come and give it a go. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you'll get the same response from me. I will say yeah. it's fucking freezing. My wife always calls me a fucking baby, mate. She's like she'll she'll like pull out an eye, yeah. eyebrow and I'll be like fuck. Mate, I, I've yeah, I, I I've done like obstacle course races before. I did rock solid, which was up in Honiton Way, I think, in March, and there was lots of um, in and out of, of natural lakes, mm. and that was fucking horrendously cold. 
And I don't know if it was that event that put me off because prior to that, I'd done like Tough Mudders and stuff and was in the, the kind of Arctic Anima or whatever they call it multiple times. But although I handled that cold quite well, like I wasn't even really shivering. Some people were going down with hypothermia and stuff. Dan Casey went down with hypothermia. It was hilarious. Did he? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I handled it well. So my body was tolerant to it, but I don't know, mate. I just didn't fucking like it. And yeah, I don't know. I feel like I got enough enough like uh enough testing I'll, stuff I'll in come my down life. and try it and you can just laugh at me mate it's I will fine. not judge you it's fine no you can't you can't I'm, I'm happy to be judged well, I can't mate. let him do it by himself so I'm going to have to do it <laughs> he's going to do it what's that there's a stoic quote in there be tolerant with others and strict with yourself if I didn't get in I'd, I'd judge myself <laughs> I'd be like come on Dave yeah I think if, if you can get me down there I'll probably go in I'll definitely I would, I'll definitely go in I'll just just bet you moan the whole time alright well we've You've heard it here now, mate. Anyway, yeah, good little plug for Operation Operation Enrichment, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So what's get the, involved. So what? So what? So what are you guys doing with that? Is that just like a like a, a support group for everybody? Like, what? What's the purpose? Of, I guess of that started group? off as a group of mates doing what they love. Yeah. Um, turned into a you touch on it with mental well being and everything. A bit of a well being group there for anyone and everyone. No judgments. Nothing. If you don't want to get in the sea, that's absolutely fine. Just being around people is everything. We learned yeah. that in lockdown, didn't we? Yeah, fucking hell, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and there are people who are struggling. And if, if you can surround yourself with positive, wholesome people, then that's only good, right? Well, that's, so, why, that's why we started this podcast, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. so, to help men. You know, there's some, there's not enough awareness, I don't think. The reason we, we do it just for men is because we can come from a position of obviously being men and not talking. I find it hard to talk about women's problems because I'm not a woman. Whereas I quite You're happily, qualified to talk I can call, as a bloke, yeah, 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 and I, that's that always pisses me off when people talk about stuff that they don't massively, they, they haven't experienced. Whereas we can we can talk about this openly and always trying to help men. But the, what you're doing is helping everyone who wants help. But well, I'm not claiming it. I'm just well, out living my life. I'm just being. I'm doing. You know, we say don't yeah, say that, do. You know, but you saying that yeah. though. But what you do it inspires other people you know what i mean like you may not and you're quite modest with it but what you're doing is way harder like if you're doing that marathon it's way harder for you to do it than for us to do it and then by you doing it just us talking about it now i'm thinking yeah i am a bit of a lazy cunt yeah we've just got us in the fucking seat let's be honest yeah <laughs> no cheers well not for me to say do you know what is i you just remind what i struggle with is heights i really hate heights and we've done a few of the jumps off um crazy uh not crazy uh gold diggings and some some high jumps oh, yeah. i i crap myself every time i'm up there <laughs> but i still do it like that's yeah. really hard for me that's yeah. way harder that's my comfort zone that's that's Damn. actually yeah. like fear though isn't it? like that's just overcoming the you know just just jump off i used to hate that yeah. do you know do you, know, do you remember um like you used to have like corinthian and then you used to have the diving boards and yeah. all that lot all my mates loved it i've done it because just to do it but i would do it a couple of times did like they that, love so. it though because they fucking loved it i hated I, it but they loved it i now love it because i hate it mm. but yeah. i'm weird <laughs> <laughs> yeah no they, they liam for example he's a fucking water baby he loves water yeah. like he was in and out there all summer whereas i'll be out playing football i'll be like oh, fuck. yeah if i didn't get a bit of fear out of it maybe i wouldn't enjoy it i think there's yeah i don't know I've become that guy. <laughs> yeah, and I think the thing that I love about the, the stuff that you guys do as well is obviously based around physical activity, you know, and and our kind of, I guess, view into that is through jiu-jitsu. And this has almost become a little bit of a jiu-jitsu podcast when it was never intended to be. It was, again, about men's mental health. I'll do jiu-jitsu if you get in the ice water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> For fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Um, but yeah, so I, I think for us, we always talk about jiu-jitsu because of the positive benefits of the physical activity and... As a result, we just, you know, started getting more and more jiu-jitsu people on. But we also found that most of the interesting people we fucking know do jiu-jitsu. And often people that are in that space are there because they've been through some sort of like adversity in their life and, and they they've they've identified that in themselves and, and again really value that that brotherhood and the physical activity. So it's super important. So I think adding the physical activity into that as well is is massive, mate. It's that personality, you know, it's that personality type where you you like a bit of grunt, you it's hard work. Yeah. So like CrossFitters are the same. People lift weights regularly, look after themselves regularly, all those types of people. Yeah. It's all, it's all, this, there's so many It's all the same life, thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's all the same thing. It's just a slightly different avenue that you're going down that you yeah. might go to more. And being strong is, especially mentally strong is not, it's not a fluke. It's not a coincidence, yeah. is it? Yeah. Like 
the yeah, I think that sometimes. I think the physical. Some... If you if you get physically strong, it definitely helps you become mentally strong, mm. because you you gain so much from that. And I don't think people who have never been physically strong realize the the amount of benefits you get from being physically strong. And the I don't know, just the progression of it. I don't know if it's just a mental barrier you're always breaking down through lifting slightly heavier, pushing yourself out a little bit further, trying to trying to motivate yourself to. Mm. You know, I don't know what you like now, but when you get, when you're lifting for ages and you get to like your PB, say on your bench, and then the, the, the increments are so small and just to keep mentally keep going, yeah, I'm going to put a kilo on or two kilos on and just doing that over and over and over again for, for years, it's, it builds up that mental resilience, doesn't it? That someone who never is, who's never gone in the gym, that's mm -hmm. that's what they struggle with. But I think this is, this is a really interesting point though, because we are seeing more and more people now and you know, it's again, a bloke's podcast. So we talk about men a lot, but women are just, you know, in a similar position, but we're in a world now where people are very inactive, you know, and people haven't experienced, you know, sort of physical hardship. You know, we're also in a world uh, where, you know, some countries pretty close to us are pretty much banning free speech now. Um, so you can't even be straight with people without risking breaking the law in some places. And you're, you're creating this, this sort of generation of people where, they don't have any of these kind of like, like they haven't cut, overcome any real adversity to call on. So how, like, what can you, so have you, have you learned any lessons or have you got any kind of pearls of wisdom that you could say to those people? Yeah. I mean, my, I would relate it to disability and I like kids growing up with disability. That's their challenge. That's their, you know, it could be anything, but I'm like, yeah, it's good that it's hard. It is good. It's good that you've got a disability. It's hard for a kid to hear that sometimes. Um, then they almost, okay, there, there becomes a point where obviously understand that certain things are hard, like certain things are difficult, but you have to try and scrape the barrel. You do, of the reality of your situation. Um, yeah, the harder it is, the better. Because you have the opportunity to then overcome more things and you get more of a sense of achievement if it's harder. Um, and anyone, you know, that go just walking into a gym that can be hard for some people like really hard but the sense of achievement you get from when you do that and you you come out the other side is unparalleled to something that seems easy to you so i think yeah go and do the hard things absolutely seek them out actively not just arrive at them when they come in your life go and get them go run head for head first into whatever situation go go do some hard things and seek discomfort and all that kind of thing Again, I'm using loads of like cliches and stuff, but that's that's become my life. Like I lived like that before without really consciously living like it. Now it's like a conscious thing that I can actively seek out and do th things. Man, that's one way to feel alive. Like it's class. Um, but yeah, I get. I guess I've done a, yeah, 34 years old now. That's 34 years of acceptance, of growth, of coming to this point. And again, I'm still, still growing every day. Um, uh, yeah, I think for for kids who are uh, you know acquire a disability or whatever, that can be really tough. I, I I get that. Yeah. Yeah. And what would you say your purpose is like now, where you are in your life at thirty four? God, that's a big question, isn't it? I don't know. <laughs> no. Um, I get up every day, and I'm like I said, I'm addicted to just life. Like I know what it feels like to to not be able to run up mountains, to not be able to even get out of bed. Like even again, the pain that I go through, that's a pleasure. You have to have that mindset. Not everyone can feel pain. Like it's a pleasure to be able to feel your legs in pain. So you have to weirdly backwards think like that because otherwise it's not, it's not possible to do some of the stuff that, you know, again, just put your shoes on. I know it sounds mundane and it sounds really like simple, but that's, that's the hardest thing I do every morning. Like that's the pain I get from putting my shoes. Anyway, waffling on. Yeah. I think um, I think I just got to do the right thing. Nothing else matters. I think that is the basis of everything in life. Um, and if I live like that through my whole career, then I think I would be in a better place now. Mm -hmm. But you, 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 you know, that's experience at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You want to do everything when you're young. You want to win every for table tennis match. It's not possible. You can't win everything, can you? Mm -hmm. um, and I think I would have let go of a lot of the stress of life um, if I had that mindset. Like, okay, there's stresses now. I've got stresses, but stress is only the unknown sometimes isn't it mm. living in imagination like that's what stress is for me um but you know each and every moment do the right thing nothing else matters i think that's that's how i 
I want to live my life. I don't know what that looks like yet, but carry on doing the things I love. Yeah. And do you ever like, like sort of allow worry into your mind about maybe the day, I mean, you know, it's going to come for all of us to be fair, sort of able-bodied or not, but the day where maybe your body does finally sort of say that's enough's enough, whether it's through old age or injury. Have you thought about that much? Yeah, I have actually. Yeah. It does worry me to be honest. Not actively. I use it as a, as a motivation rather than a focus. I think that's really key. Same with pain. Use that as motivation. Not if you're focused on it, it becomes a bit of a negative, doesn't it? Um, but I know that will come. But I think I've been through various iterations of that in whatever guys to the point where I've felt like, like I said, that that my career transition, everything, that was my absolute low. Um, I have to remind myself when that comes again that there is a way out. There is a way of scraping that barrel. Even if I don't feel it at the time, I can consciously just remind myself that there is a way. There is always a way. Um, so what that looks like is is a is a puzzle for everyone isn't it but yeah nice mate yeah good i'm sure you've got some big plans moving forward as well what you got coming up next um yeah <laughs> well some i got some things coming up which probably need to stay under wraps but um it's all it's all just becoming just getting better just getting better i think that's very vague i realize that but especially the crossfit and and the high rocks like i want to become an absolute animal i want to be you know, I want to be that that person who's who can do anything. I know that again, a bit of a cliche, but uh, yeah, I just want to become physically and mentally impenetrable, like to the point where nothing can stop me. That's literally what I want to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in a nutshell, is that a good soundbite for you? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mate. I wonder when yeah. the book's coming out, mate. Yeah, um, yeah, but. Um, I mean, again, my life in terms of my career is going off in a different trajectory now. Whether or not that's the right trajectory is questions that I'm going through. But I think everyone has those thoughts. And what are you doing with your life? Like, I feel like I'm doing some good things with my life. Um, but there's always a there's always a way of um, evolving that into something more. I think I'm always searching for more. So, a bit of a perfectionist, which is a blessing and a, and a curse, isn't it? can't always be perfect in life and i've let go of that a lot in the last in the last few years so mm-hmm. yeah that's a good mindset mate you've done a lot mate it's been there's stuff we've not cool. touched on that i can't even remember myself so <laughs> yeah. it's been great chatting to you yeah like, no it's been really thanks good for having mate. me in this is uh truly truly inspiring mate genuinely it's uh i think that's for me and paul we talk about it all the time but speaking to people like you on a regular basis it, it motivates me so much. And sometimes, like you said, life gets in the way and you do get down and you think, oh, am I doing the right thing? And, you know, I'm, what, what direction am I going in? But just speaking to someone like you today definitely pushes me, you know, to not quit and not give up and to keep driving forward, you know, because, you know, it, it's, like you said, it's it's way hard. Like the things you're doing with your disability is, is absolutely incredible. And I, know, I don't think I would be as strong as you. That's the honest truth. What if, if, I don't know. I, I don't, think you I don't would think. be. If you've been through what, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm just being honest how I see it. Like you, you know, incredible, genuinely incredible. Well, when you said that, like, honestly, my needs and wants have changed now. That used to, it used to all be for me. I used to be very, you have to be selfish as a professional athlete, right? You have to be very single minded. That's your goal. Nothing will stop me towards it. But now that calibration has happened to the point where I get more satisfaction out of coaching the kids out of seeing someone else do well because I've helped them than me doing well myself. If that makes it's nice to do well yourself, yeah. obviously, but in a way that again, maybe that's a little bit of Sam's psychology coming in. He found the marathon high. He carried my wheelchair on the back. I don't know if we said that without the wheels, cause we were burning the boats, obviously, but him helping me was his motivation to himself. Cause it's hard to run a marathon, let alone with a wheelchair on your back. That's yeah, a heavy fair, one as well. He's, he's got himself in good neck. Yeah. Hasn't he? He's been a podgy little fucker. Shall I claim it? Shall I? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm joking. He's done that all himself. But obviously, doing it together is has been an absolute blessing. Um, but yeah, again, weirdly, sometimes you can't be strong for yourself. Like, but when you have to be strong for someone else, that's powerful. That's like teamwork, isn't it? Like, yeah. that's really powerful. Um, and I, I'm I'm feeling that now, for sure. Mm. Yeah. So that's 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 what life's all about, isn't it? Yeah. Peace, love, and happiness help each other out. 
mate. I think that's us, mate. I think we're yeah, done, mate. Cool. Thanks. That was brilliant. Mate, thank, thank you so much, much for having thank me. Thank you, mate. Thank you.